though many of you will already know him from when he was lecturer in art history at La Trobe. Frank is a specialist in Spanish art and early modern Dutch and Flemish painting. He has been visiting assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, and guest lecturer in Baroque art in the art history and theory department at the University of Sydney. He has held numerous scholarships and grants, such as the Fulbright Hayes Grant and the Grant for Research in Spain for Foreign Hispanists. His PhD thesis for the University of Michigan was entitled Supernatural Themes in the Art of Francisco de Goya. Please welcome Frank as he speaks to us on Reason and Folly, the Drawings and Prints of Francisco Goya. Thank you, Frank. Well, I wanted to explain that this talk was inspired by the exhibition at the National Gallery of Victoria on Goya's drawings from the Prado Museum. Unfortunately, very few people got to see this exhibition. Um, so it, it is, it's a great tragedy really to bring all these wonderful works from the Prado uh, to Madrid and so uh, to Melbourne and so few people got to see it. The other reason for the talk is that um, uh, last year, 2021, was the 275th commemoration of Goya's birth. And there have been numerous publications and exhibitions because of that. Um, Goya, of course, was uh, born on the 30th of March, 1746 in Fuente Todos. And um, he died in 1828 on April 16th. Um, so 275 years, a great, great um, uh, year, a great year uh, 2021 for, the, for 275 years. And so let's begin. Um, and I'm going to talk about the drawings and prints and the theme of reason and folly. Um, so here we're beginning with a self-portrait of Goya in the studio. Um, this is a very interesting self-portrait because he's wearing a very curious hat in this self-portrait. Um, his son Javier told us that um, he used to put candles on this hat so that he could work through the night because um, he worked very late through the night. So there you see him with the famous hat and he's dressed in the popular 18th century a costume of a majo is a, a popular character in Spain at the time. And there's a, this beautiful um, light in the back which is very important for, for Goya's paintings, of course. Um, as you know, uh, Francisco de Goya's drawings and prints are among his greatest creations. Of course, he's a very great painter, but um, the drawings and prints are equally uh, great. And I'm um, just going to show you a few um, self-portraits um, as, as I begin to talk about the drawings and prints. Um, this beautiful brush and gray wash drawing from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, at, his earliest knowledge of drawings and prints seems to have come from his first teacher in Zaragoza, Jose Luzan Martinez, uh, who Goya himself explained, taught him the principles of drawing, making him copy the best prints that he had. In 1770 to 71, during a trip to Italy, Goya acquired a pocket notebook in which he made detailed notes and sketched people and works of art that interested him. Um, near the end of the 1770s, Goya began to concentrate on printmaking. He had studied prints by the leading painter printmakers of the past, such as Giuseppe de Ribera, um, and of his own age, such as Gian Battista, Gian Domenico, and Lorenzo Tiepolo. Um, in the inventory of the artist's possessions drawn up in 1812, there are references to numerous prints, including an unspecified collection of works by Pironese and 10 prints by Rembrandt. That's extremely important, the Rembrandt reference. According to Goya's son Javier, his father was an observer with veneration of Velázquez and Rembrandt. But even more, he studied and observed nature, who he said was his mistress. Curiously, in the announcements and many captions for his own prints, Goya continually referred to himself as a painter. And you see, he does that here in the, the title page of the Caprichos. He says, Francisco de Goya Lucientes, pintor, painter, um, which may seem a bit strange. Um, but uh, this is certainly to advertise his abilities in that regard, but also uh, perhaps to disassociate himself from the printmakers of his age, who mainly copied the works of others. Uh, during the 18th century in Spain, most engravers and etchers merely reproduced religious images, 
portraits, other works of art, maps, and depictions of regional costumes and famous buildings. In contrast, Goya's nearly 300 etchings and lithographs were all highly original creations. So this is a big difference uh, to what was actually going on uh, in, in prints and drawings in, in Spain. Now, most of Goya's um, prints were conceived as series representing particular themes that were based on the artist's personal involvement and interpretation of the ideas and events of his time. He usually made drawings in preparation for his prints. Some, of were, some were composed uh, compositional studies um, while others were used to transfer the design to the print. From about 1794 or 1795 and over a period of 30 years until his death in 1828, he produced eight drawing albums of various length and size and about 550 of these drawings have survived. Um, in 1958, Eleanor Sayer, who was a specialist in Goya's works and curator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, described the characteristics of each of the eight albums and labeled them with the letters A to H. Since Sayer's classifications, many subsequent Goya scholars have further clarified the sequence of the albums and suggested descriptive titles that broadly reflect their subjects. The albums have variously been called books, sketchbooks, private albums, and journal albums. Um, the Prado scholars have now decided that they should be called sketchbooks, but this is all very relative. I'm still using the term that Eleanor Sayer started with album. Of course, Goya uh, used his own term was cuaderno in Spanish, which is more like our notebook of that sort. So anyway, it's, um, whatever you want to refer to them by, uh, perhaps we'll, we'll remain with the album since Eleanor started this classification of the drawings. While Goya's etchings and lithographs were intended for publication, these bound drawing albums reflect his private thoughts and ideas and served as his private diaries or journals of what he saw, felt, and imagined. So they're very personal, very personal works. Now, Goya's two earliest drawing albums are known as the San Lucar album, album A, and Madrid album, album B. Of course, Goya never thought of these works as by these titles. Of course, these are all given to, them, to, to his works by um, Eleanor Sayer and other art historians. Um, and it was previously thought that the first of these albums was begun in the, seven, the summer of 1796 during his stay with this lady, who you're seeing here, Maria del Pilar Cayetana de Silva y Alvarez de Toledo. She had more names than that, but that's enough. <laughs> and she was the 13th Duchess of Alba. Um, and uh, this uh, took place at her estate in San Lucar de Barameda, which is near Cadiz. Um, while the second album was thought to have been probably begun in San Lucar and finished in Madrid in 1797. But it has more re recently been thought that Goya began the first of these albums earlier, about 1794, before leaving Madrid for his trip to Andalusia. And that Goya began working on the second album, the Madrid album, about 1795, not long after beginning the first album, that's about a year earlier than previously thought. I'm not convinced by this change of dating, by the way. Uh, I think the reverse dating of the first album, which is not that convincing, is based, it's based on the fact that Goya in August 1794 uh, received this commission to portray the Duchess that resulted in this portrait that we've been looking at, the portrait of the Duchess in, in white, which is in the um, uh, Alba collection in Madrid. Um, and he finished this in 1794. We know that this is 1794, uh, 1794, sorry. And, um, and uh, so this portrait is what's changed some of the theories about the dating um, that then he finished, um, he finally finished the thing in 1795 um, and he started working on it in 1794. Now, two drawings from the album seem to relate to the portrait. This one, that, a, scholars generally consider this to re represent the Duchess um, and uh, 1796 here. Um, uh, and this is a curious drawing because on the verso, you see this. Now, scholars, um, Manuel Amain, especially the curator of, of uh, Goya at the Prado Museum doesn't think that the verso shows the Duchess of Alba. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with that at all. I think it does show the Duchess of Alba lifting up her skirts. It's a very kind of shocking 
uh, a drawing in many ways, but it refers to the, a classical Venus statue. And there were poems of the period that related the Duchess of Alba to a new Venus. Um, so I, I think that it does, does show her. On, there's a lot of debate about what Goya's relationship with the Duchess of Alba now uh, because of Manuela Mena's book where she feels that Goya did not have an amorous relationship with the Duchess. But I'm not totally convinced by that, by, as you can see by that drawing there. Now, the second drawing that relates to the um, uh, portrait is this one, the Duchess of Alba with her hand raised. Um, and this is in Rotterdam um, um, here. Um, but I, as I go back to the older dating, I'll show you that this drawing, um, the Maha out for a stroll, which is in the San Lucar album, um, uh, it is very close to the other portrait of the Duchess that Goya did, the Duchess of Alba in black, which is in the Hispanic Society of New York in 1797. Um, moreover, uh, Valentin Carderera, uh, who owned several pages of the San Lucar album, uh, wrote in 1860 that Goya started this album on a journey with the Duchess when she took up residence at her lordly villa at San Lucar de Barrameda, suggesting a date of 1796. So I still prefer the earlier dating to the new uh, revisionized dating uh, because of what I've just explained. Now for uh, the 18 drawings on nine double seated uh, sheets of the first album, Goya drew with a brush and carbon ink wash on both sides of each album page. So they're, they're done on both sides. His light, delicate brush strokes and wash technique perfectly captured the lively poses of the figures and spontaneous mood of each scene. As we can see, the Duchess appears in some of these drawings, obviously, uh, while others represent various young women, perhaps her servant, or now thought by scholars perhaps to be prostitutes that Goya observed in Cadiz or Madrid bordellos, um, enjoying siestas, uh, enjoying afternoon strolls, or sitting and reclining voluptuously in the nude. Um, th this drawing is a very beautiful drawing that was in the exhibition at, at the National Gallery. Young woman pulling up her stocking, uh, drawn, as you can see, with the tip of the brush uh, and ink wash against the white paper, so very lightly done. Um, and it depicts uh, a woman uh, with a tub and a bed, implying a bedroom setting. This served as the um, inspiration for this capriccio um, entitled, It Is Well Stretched, the Enterada Esta, plate 17 in the capriccios. Um, now, you can see that there are big changes between the drawing and uh, the final um, uh, etching, because in the, uh, final etching, he's added the seated figure of an old procurus, who we call a Celestina in Spanish. And this is because a, a famous literary character um, who was both a procurus and a witch, that's very important that she was also a witch. Um, in Fernando de Rojas, it's a great classic of Spanish literature, La Celestina, that was first published in 1499. Now, the, this emphasis on women continues in the first half of the Madrid album. Um, and it continues in album B. However, in album B, the so-called Madrid album, there are scenes with male and female figures who relate emotionally to each other in settings that have more convincing effects of depth and chiaroscuro. There are almost a hundred drawings in this Madrid album. And like the San Lucar, they, they're sketched with a brush and carbon ink wash on both sides of each page. But the pages are larger carefully numbered, and in the second part of the album contain inscriptions written in brush and carbon ink wash, or pin and sepia, sometimes uh, ink on both. Throughout the first half of this album, Goya portrays a Rococo world of uh, afternoon promenades, swings, concerts, and especially amorous relationships, uh, which in a few scenes end in quarrels or death. The mood and style of this suddenly changes with this sheet uh, sheet 55 in the album and 56, which is on the back. And you see both of them here. On page 55, a woman dressed as a maja. This is a woman of the lower class in 18th century Spain. And in my opinion, resembles very much the, the Duchess of Alba. I'll just go back here a moment. There. If you compare to the portrait of the Duchess in black, I think it, it, it does show the Duchess of Alba. Um, and she holds a half mask and turns her head away from two figures in grotesque carnival costumes 
which may have been inspired by costumes Goya saw when he attended the carnival in Cadiz in 1797. The title, Mascaras Crueles, which you see at the very top of the drawing, Cruel Masks, in, um, suggests that this woman's face is as cruel a mask as those worn by the two masqueraders. Now on the back, the re related verso, um, inscribed Brujas a Bolar, which is about to fly. Uh, this is the first depiction of witchcraft in Goya's art. Uh, and it implies that treachery and vice convert women into witches. Uh, two chanting witch instructors with uh, carothas, these are the tall pointed caps worn by victims of the Inquisition. Um, and they use their tongs uh, here uh, to support uh, this book um, with uh, the um, uh, uh, men for the female novice, you see. And those tongs, of course, re re refer to some of the tortures used by the Inquisition. Um, and they're holding this book uh, for this new female novice who's going to be incorporated into witchcraft. Um, and a, sated, a, a seated satyr supports um, her on his shoulders um, here as she's studying the, the witch's commandments. Goya not only indicates that the activities of the Spanish inquisitors were as barbarous and irrational as the witchcraft crimes they condemned, but even more importantly suggests that this hog-faced novice becomes a witch by submitting to her animal instincts and superstitious beliefs. The, the satyr symbolizes lust, of course, and lust raises her up so that she can accept the irrational doctrines of witchcraft. After this page, the remaining drawings in the album are in some uh, they're more coarse, more angular in style, and they carry um, terse ca captions in, in brush and pen, or sometimes both, uh, which ironically underline their meanings. The Spanish words uh, mascara, masquerades, and uh, caricaturas, caricatures, appear frequently, and there's an emphasis on scenes of social and sexual satire. All these changes indicate a new satirical intention, which continues in Goya's Sueños drawings of 1797 to 98, and of course, it culminates in the Caprichos, uh, the printed series, a very important printed series, of so published uh, first edition, 1799. Now, these changes also express a growing disillusionment with human nature that seems to have been brought about after Goya's deafness. He went completely deaf, and he had a lingering illness that occurred. This all took place from 1793 to 1796. So he started creating um, at least 28 drawings, mainly in pen and iron gall ink with carbon ink wash that he called sueños, dreams. So this is the dream series. Um, and these served as direct sources for many of the caprichos, even though Goya also created for the final etchings, many other preparatory drawings in red chalk or red ink wash, which unlike the sueños never have inscriptions. Um, and then he changed the title of the series from Sueños, from Dreams, to Caprichos. Uh, capricho was a term employed in 18th century Spanish art as a synonym for general irrationality, but also referred to any work of art in which the artist used creative invention to break away from traditional rules. Now, it's interesting to follow one of these um, Madrid album um, uh, drawings that we've been looking at here through to its final conception as a capriccio print. So you can see these went through a very lot, lot, lot of different stages before getting to the caprichos. Um, this Madrid album drawing is numbered 63 and it has an inscription at the bottom that, that says caricatura alegre, merry caricature. So this is the merry caricature. Um, it's done in brush and carbon ink wash, can be dated between 1796 and 1797. It shows five monks grouped around a table. The principal seated figure at the left has this incredibly phallic nose, you notice, that he's propping up uh, here so they can spoon more food into his mouth. Um, and the central monk with an uh, elongated angular face, puffy eyes and a flat nose holds the spoon. Uh, the figure seated at the right has a skull-like face um, and grins demonically. The standing monk behind holds a bowl of food and looks at the long-nosed seated monk while a second standing monk with a hooked nose was only very lightly shown, as you can see in the background there, um, uh, and he's looking out over at the other monks. You notice they, they're all broadly indicated without many details, and their angular robes stand out against the dark washed background. And this broad, loose technique perfectly conveys the satirical meaning of this ironic Mary caricature 
in which he comments, of course, on monastic lust and gluttony. Now, this is the next one. This is the dream drawing, and it has an inscription, dream of some men who were eating us up. Um, and it's done in pen and iron gall ink, uh, which is, of course, very different from the, the uh, Madrid album drawing. And it's still conceived in terms of two triangular groupings. But the standing figure in the left background has been replaced by a goat-like figure. I think you can just make that out if you look closely. It's that goat-like figure. Uh, there you can see it better. Um, and the seated monk at the left no longer has a large phallic nose. Both he and the central figure have their eyes closed and blindly spoon the food into their gaping mouths. The seated monk at the right, instead of having a skull-like face, now has a gluttonous smirk as if he were licking his chops. And the more rustic monk waiter behind looks down in the tray, and on the tray there's a human skull. Um, the shadows are indicated with very exact parallel pin strokes, and the entire work is much more minutely detailed than the first sketch. There's an arc of light at the upper right that does not seem to be able to penetrate this dark, unenlightened scene. And Goy is now contrasting, uh, well, and really con concentrating on more of the monk's gluttony, you see. But the goat in the background may also refer to lust, goats often are used to refer to lust. The human skull on the tray indicates that these monks live off their followers. And so in this drawing, Goya satirizes the excessive wealth and overindulgence of the monastic orders of his day. Now, the third version of, of this is in red ink wash over black chalk. Um, and this is, is very, very closely related to the final capriccio. You notice it's much more broadly done, and there are more dramatic contrasts of light and dark in this one. Um, uh, the seated monk at the right is more demonic, and he now has horn-like tufts of hair. The standing waiter looks down at the tray, but you notice the tray is now empty. There's no skull there. Uh, the area at the right is now a large arched opening that resembles the gaping cavern-like mouths of the monks. So he's eliminated any reference to lust and intensely concentrates on the monk's gluttony now. And now we'll see the final capriccio here, uh, which is capriccio 13, uh, an etching in Aquitaine, and it's entitled Estan Calientes, They Are Hot. Um, now, you notice all the figures are in darkness except the seated monk at the left, illuminated by diagonal beams of light that strike his head, shoulders, and lower robe, as well as part of the table. Uh, burnishing is used to highlight the collar, nose, and heads uh, and hands of the central monk and the bald head of the seated monk at the right. The left and uh, center monks still have gaping cavernous mouths. The waiter monk looks at the group and recalls the figure in Mary caricature. Uh, the um, arch-like area at the right, you notice, is now completely defined. Uh, it's completely dark because of uh, aqua tinting. So very little light is penetrating this nightmare world of overindulgence. Uh, the ironic engraved inscription uh, Estan Calientes has a double meaning. Many of Goya's inscriptions have double meanings in Spanish, and it implies that the monks are hot, but it also implies that they're in sexual heat. Um, so it's interesting because by relating the monks' gluttony to their lust, this inscription goes back to the Mary caricature, but it's a little more indirect because it's in the title, you see. Uh, one of these manuscripts of the period of Adelardo Lopez de Ayala, who describes it as stupid monks stuck themselves at mealtime in the refectories, laughing at the world. How can they be anything but hot? How can they be anything but in heat? You say. And you notice too, sometimes the, 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 the use of the um, burnishing and, and so on creates other faces. I've been studying this recently and you notice it in the, in the folds of the drapery down here, there's, a, there's actually a face. And this is the copper plate on which the etching was created. Go back. And this is in the Calcografia, all the, um, the etchings, the, uh, the copper plates are in the Calcografia in Madrid and you can see them there, they have a permanent display of the, the etchings. Now, the, the, so that, that was the final uh, etched capriccio. Now we're going to look at the first dream drawing, which shows the seated artist slouched over his desk in a deep sleep. This is from the Sueños uh, series. Uh, while behind we have these bats, owls, and a sinister cat with gleaming eyes. Now in a preliminary drawing, here, you see this other drawing, um, 1797, um, it, it's, uh, 
it shows Goya definitely, it's definitely Goya in this drawing because he's asleep over his printing press. At, a, at the lower left, there's a copper plate of his, his etching after Velazquez's Queen Margarita of Austria on horseback that he'd made 20 years earlier when he started making prints. Um, on the right is a damaged area of the drawing, and you can just make out the image of a cat over there. You see then that damaged part at, at the uh, lower right. Um, emerging from the artist's head in flashes of light and darkness are Goya's features. So there are two self-portraits of Goya in the area above, you know, above his sleeping head. Um, uh, and um, there's also uh, visions that include an ass uh, and a nocturnal birds that symbolize ignorance and vices. In the dream drawing, Goya has replaced the printing press with a block-like disc. And you notice now if you compare it to the, the other drawing, um, uh, on which he's written universal language drawn and etched by Francisco de Goya in the year 1797. And in the bottom margin, he states the author dreaming, his only intention is to banish harmful common beliefs and to perpetuate with this work of Capriccio's the solid testimony of truth. Now here's the final Capriccio. Um, and he actually decided, uh, as we've seen, to use his top-headed um, self-portrait to introduce the, the Capriccios, but he had originally meant to um, have the first dream uh, be uh, uh, the introduction to the, the whole series, but he changed his mind about that. And he turned the first dream drawing into Capriccio 43, um, which is uh, titled well, I should explain to you first that sueño can be uh, titled either dream or sleep. So it's usually called the, the sleep of reason produces monsters, but I still often call it the dream of reason produces monsters since it was from the dream series, you see. But in Spanish, of course, the similar, both things are similar. Um, so, uh, so you notice the prominent arc of light that held back the forces of darkness um, in the drawing has been covered over with aquatint. So lots of aquatinting and, and many more bats and owls now fly in this ominous night sky. There's a new group of four owls and a cat behind the sleeping artist's chair. One of these owls has, has seized a crayon holder and about to prod Goya uh, to uh, unite his fantasy with his reason. And as he states in a commentary in a manuscript in his handwriting that's in the Prado Museum, Fantasy deserted by reason produces impossible monsters. United with it, fantasy is the mother of the arts and the source of their wonders. Now, um, the first dream drawing was followed by nine scenes of witchcraft and sorcery. And in the etched Capriccio, he placed these witchcraft scenes after Capriccio 43. The, so this is the second dream drawing, which is in pen and iron gall ink. And it shows two witches attempting to fly and, and contains a caption that states, trial of novice witches of their first flight. And they fearfully test themselves for the task. The drawing finally became Capriccio 60. There we are, there's the final Capriccio, um, like 60 ensayos trials. On the ground in both we see a human skull, a bone, a dead animal with its legs tied and two cats next to a double handled unguent pot. There are also two spools that Jose Lopez Rey describes, most probably the symbols of the witches individual destinies, which they believe themselves to have wrested from the fates through their pact with Satan. The goat devil with twisted horns and glaring eyes, similar in, in both, but appears more mysterious in the sketch because of the shading effects around his body, you notice. Um, light and dark contrasts are more effectively used in the etching to emphasize the goat uh, and the flying figures. In the sketch, the floating witch at the right is old and ugly and has a wide toothy smile, but in the etching, she's young and attractive with a smaller smile and more regular features. In the etching, um, the uh, younger witch um, is uh, pulling the central witch by the ear, and she looks up at her with a rather fearful expression. Now, this, there's a manuscript in the, the Prado, as I said, written in Goya's handwriting, and it describes the Capriccio as follows. Little by little, she is making progress. Now she takes her first steps, and in time, she will know as much as her teacher. So she's being instructed in witchcraft uh, here. Now, uh, just to summarize the Capriccio's a little bit, 
When viewed as a series, the 80 etchings that comprise Los Caprichos become a universal denouncement of all the empty banalities, prejudices, hypocrisies, and follies of unenlightened humankind. Goya's written titles often contain double meanings and are ironically ambiguous, but the images create what the artist in his first dream, as we saw, called a universal language. Now, I want to turn now to the Disasters of War, another uh, very important series by Goya, uh, later, of course, from the Caprichos. Uh, this is uh, brought about by the entry of Napoleon's troops into Spain in early 1808, began this tragic period of the country's history known as the War of Independence, and it lasted until the British victory over the French on the 22nd of July, 1812, and the final expulsion of the French in 1813. This war and its monstrous effects prompted Goya between 1810 and 1820 to create these etchings that he called fatal consequences of Spain's bloody war with Bonaparte and other emphatic caprices in 85 prints. Um, his title and the final form that he intended for the whole work are known from a, um, a complete bound set of numbered and, and uh, titled proofs that are in the British Museum. Uh, and he gave this to his friend, the art historian, Juan Agustin San Bermudez, so that um, San Bermudez could uh, check and correct the, the spelling, the penciled epigraphs for the, the plates. When the Real Academia de San Fernando, the Royal Academy in Spain, um, decided to publish the series in 1863, long after Goya's death, um, as the disasters of war, um, the numbers and epigraphs from Seán's prints were engraved on the, the copper plates. So that's how we got the, uh, the titles. The Academy only printed 80 plates, did not include the prints numbered 81 and 82, and three small etchings of chained prisoners, which ended Seán's album, since it did not possess the copper plates for these works. So they, the copper plates appeared late, much later, the Academy didn't have them. Now they, the Disasters of War opens with this scene and it's entitled Sad Presentiments of What is to Come, probably created in the post-war period between 1814 and 1820. So it's a later work in the series, created later, but it opens the series. The etching represents an emaciated Spaniard in rags who kneels, extends both arms and looks up imploringly to heaven while monsters lurk in the darkness around him, suggesting the horrors of war and the oppression that are about to unfold in the series. Following this dirge-like opening, the first section of the series, plates two to 47, portrays the wartime atrocities perpetrated by both the French and the Spaniards. Both first Spanish men and then Spanish women are shown attacking and resisting the French invaders. And next there are scenes of rape, execution, and the piling up and despoiling of corpses. Uh, the plates numbered 20, 22, and 27 have dates on them, 1810. So they're some of the earliest. And they're stylistically also among the earliest created for the series. And they depict scenes that Goya could have observed in Zaragoza in 1808, when, as he explained in a letter of the 2nd of October that year, he was called by this man, General Jose de Palafox, who he did this uh, portrait of, um, to see and examine the ruins of that city with the purpose of painting the glorious deeds of its citizens, from which, Goya says, I cannot excuse myself, as I am so interested in the glory of my native land. And you see Goya, of course, what had grown up in Zaragoza, so it's very important to him to go there uh, to observe what's, what's actually um, going on. Now here's one of the uh, uh, plates that is dated, plate 22, dated 1810. It's entitled All This and More, and it shows five bodies lying in a heap on the bare ground in a desolate landscape on the outskirts of a city. Um, in the preparatory drawing, which was included in the, in the uh, National Gallery of Victoria, um, uh, it's a red chalk and over black chalk. The setting is treated more broadly with the buildings in the right distance more lightly shown and figures of soldiers suggested in the upper right, uh, the upper left, sorry, upper left. Um, in the etching, these uh, soldiers have been replaced by a foreshortened dead body and some of the facial expressions and positions of the dead have been changed as has the shape of the, uh, the foreground hat look closely. Here's just a closer view of the drawing. You can see a bit better there. So he did, did make these changes about it. This, this plate, this is plate 27, uh, another signed and dated 1810 work. Um, and it has the ironic title, Charity. And it shows men pushing dead bodies that have been stripped of their clothing into a common grave with neither feeling nor compassion. 
Now you notice that observer standing in the background. Uh, many scholars uh, feel that that could uh, be a, a, a portrait, a self-portrait of Goya. And you notice that he has a rather, he has his arms folded and a rather impassive expression on his face. Um, and it, it probably is a, a reference to Goya himself. And plate 44 is entitled, Yo lo vi, I saw it, I saw it. And it seems to be based on his, the artist's firsthand experience during his journey to Zaragoza of seeing Aragonese peasants who in late 1808 were forced to, they're forced to abandon their villages before the advancing fresh French troops um, uh, here. And you notice that Goya again very critically contrasts the frightened mother um, carrying her baby while encouraging her other child to run for safety to the fat priest at the left who is fleeing, more concerned clutching his money bag. And you notice his money bag is as round and fat as his stomach. Numerous other scenes in the first section of Goya's Disasters of War show showing Spaniards are sadistically hanged, shot, and tortured by the French. And his, probably his most savage denunciation of human cruelty occurs in this plate 39 entitled, Great Feet with Dead Men. Uh, the mutilated and castrated bodies, severed limbs, and head that hang from a tree like meat on a butcher's hook um, serve as mute testimonies to the barbarous act committed by both the French and the Spanish. Uh, this indictment of man's brutality toward his fellow man represents, in my opinion, the total collapse of the so-called age of enlightenment that Goya lived in. One of the most tragic consequences of the war was famine, and plates 48 to 64, which form the second major group in the series, seems based on the Madrid famine of 1811 to 12, when almost 20,000 people died. In this scene, uh, in these various scenes, uh, the, he juxtaposes the dead with the starving who are forced to beg. In some plates, the famine stricken receive charity, even though it be only with a cup of broth. But in others, they're ignored by French soldiers and even mocked by fellow Spaniards. In this one, entitled Unhappy Mother, sorry, we're in the wrong one. This is it, Unhappy Mother, Madre Infeliz. Um, this is plate 50. Um, we see against a desolate aquatinted night background, a dramatically illuminated group of three men who carry off the lifeless body of the young mother. She's a famine victim, obviously. Uh, and while her little daughter runs after them, sobbing and now alone in the world. And now this one is entitled The Beds of Death. This is plate 62. Uh, Goya's composition is very similar to his red chalk preparatory drawing, which you can compare here. Um, uh, but of course, uh, the etching is intensified by the contrast between the dark aquatinted background and the luminous standing figure of the woman wrapped in a blanket who covers her face with her hands to block out the odor of putrefaction and, and the vision of the mounds of shrouded dead bodies piled up behind her. This solitary figure conveys the loneliness, despair, and anguish of the living when confronted by countless dead and dying. Now, the last section of the Disasters of War, which extends from plate 65 to plate 82 in San Bermudez's album, contains these so-called emphatic caprices. Um, 18 allegorical scenes that refer to the post-war period after 1814, when King Ferdinand VII, in collaboration with the church, abolished the liberal constitution of Cadiz, brutally persecuted the Spanish liberals, and reimposed the Inquisition and the judicial practice of torture. Goya portrays the renewed forces of absolutism and fanaticism as monstrous animalized beings, inspired in part by the animals in this enormous book-long poem, Gian Battista Casti's poem, Gli Animali Parlanti, The Talking Animals. This was written in 1802. In uh, this plate we've been looking at, plate 71, against the common good, Goya depicts a seated creature wearing a soutane-like garment who bends over to write in a large open book supported on his lap while resting his feet on a terrestrial globe. He has a basically human face, but two bat wings take the place of ears. There's a bat perched on his back and his hands and feet end in sharp claws. The bat wing creature is based on the vampire that appears in Canto 24 of Costi's long poem, The Talking Animals, that Costi describes as a skillful fellow in the Kabbalah and in money exchange, an intriguer, an eminent bloodsucker, 
a flying ultramarine quadruped very nearly equal to a large bat. Goya, however, uses Casti's vampire to condemn Pope Pius VII, um, who after the War of Independence totally negated the church's spiritual mission by reinvoking the forces of obscuritism and absolutism in Spain through his support of the Inquisition and the Holy Alliance. Like the vampire in Casti's poem who represents the crown at a Congress of Animals that takes place after a terrible battle, Pius VII supported the Holy Alliance that helped maintain King Ferdinand VII's absolutism and later at the Congress of Verona in 1822 entrusted France with the destruction of the Spanish liberal regime. Goya considers pa Pius VII a spiritual imposter as he makes clear by juxtaposing the vampire-like pontiff to the background scene where you notice in the background, there's this bearded old man raising up his arms. That represents Moses throwing out his arms in anger as he has just smashed the tables, uh, the tablets of the law upon discovering the people worshiping a golden calf. Um, the people in the etching, however, do not worship a pagan idol, but rather bow down before the blood sucking bad eared pontiff who hypocritically uses one hand to point up to heaven and the other to write decrees against the common good. So Goya indicates that Pius VII's decrees, which deny liberty for the people, are a violation of the Ten Commandments. As a result, this vampire-like Pope's denial of his spiritual mission is causing the chair he has inherited from St. Peter to sink into the ground. You notice the chair that he's sitting on is sinking into the ground. And his continual promulgation of decrees against the common good will finally bring about the total collapse of the, his ecclesiastical authority. Now, this continues in plate 72. Um, continues the symbolism by showing the consequences of the decrees. The Pope has now been transformed into a giant human-faced vampire bat that sucks the blood from the corpse of the Spaniards who's wrapped in a winding sheet. The flock of bats that also continue to bleed the cadaver seem to refer to the Spanish priests and monks of the post-war period who propagated superstition and ignorance to continue living at the expense of the common people. Goy implies that after six years of war and famine, the people symbolized by the dead Spaniard wrapped in a shroud continued to be sucked dry by the monstrous Pope and his horde of voracious bat-like priests and monks. And that's the preparatory drawing. You see a red chalk uh, drawing there. This is the next one called the, the carnivorous vulture. This is plate 76. Now he shows the Pope in the guise of a carnivorous vulture to imply that even though he has sucked the blood from the lifeless Spanish people, he continues to gorge himself on their flesh. Then in the next one, in plate 77, the rope is breaking. The Pope is finally depicted in fully human form, but his billowing cape, which helps to give him balance on the rope, recalls the vulture's flapping wings, you notice. Even though this figure does not wear a maniple and the papal tiara, as he does in Goya's red chalk drawing, which would have been, he never would, would have been able to publish. Of course, he never published the series in his lifetime, but anyway, as you know. So he's doing this balancing act, you see, um, reminiscent of a carnival performance. And, and this is a, a, a farcical repudiation of a spiritual mission. Uh, and the depiction of the fraying rope above the crowd, you notice the rope is fraying. This suggests he's about to lose his power over the people. Now, the series, the published series ends with these two plates, Truth Has Died and Will She Rise Again? This is the, the end of the, the Academy's version because there were some other uh, ones in Sayan's album. Um, so um, this seems to refer to the abolition in 1814 of the Constitution of Cadiz, the document that Goya and his liberal compatriots felt was the precursor of a new era of Spanish history. In both plates, the female personification of truth dressed in white with her breast exposed lies dead, but continues to emit dazzling rays of light, um, recalling the representation of the constitution as a resplendent book in engravings from the period of, uh, these are engravings that depict the, the book of the constitution. Goya implies that the uh, abolition of the constitution signifies the death of truth for Spain. In plate 80, truth's partially interred figure emits even brighter rays of light than in uh, plate. 79, but members of the clergy do everything in their power um, to prevent her resurrection. A cowled monk holds a club in one hand and picks up a rock with the other to hurl at her. A companion monk with thick lips extends another club towards her. And a floating cat-like monster, notice that, that uh, a cat-like monster, 
there you see the cat like monster is this is the the last one um will she rise again see he's holding a book which probably refers uh, to the bible um and it's being used of course against her um, in in the uh uh, way that this figure is holding it. And so this cat-like member of the clergy misinterprets biblical teachings and uses them as a weapon against the constitution. One man who kneels behind truth's leafed crowned head prays for her resurrection. If you look very closely, you see the man there in the background, right behind the rays of light right behind her head. And he he's gagged, of course. Um, and this, of course, refers to Spaniards after King Ferdinand VII's return. He's gagged so he cannot condemn the enemies encircling her. Goya's interrogative title for Plate 80, Will She Rise Again, leaves the restoration of the Constitution of 1812 in doubt, but the greater luminosity of truth in this print, who he identifies with the Constitution, does promise hope for Spain in the future. Now, at about this time that Goya was working on the disasters of war, he created um, a series of drawings for album C, we, we call this album C. This is the longest of his eight drawing albums that originally consisted of 133 sheets. Now the Prado has 120 of these sheets, five more are in other collections, while another eight are still unknown. So there's still eight that have never been found. Goya drew on only one side of each page now and employed carbon black ink for the drawings up to sheet 59. But then he used the warmer tonalities of iron gall ink for the remaining sheets to accentuate the darker and increasingly more dramatic scenes. There's debate about the dating of the album, but I think the most convincing period is, is from 1814 to 1823 that includes the post-war years of repression following Ferdinand VII's return to power in March 1814 and ends with this liberal triennial 1820 to 23 when Ferdinand was forced to reestablish the liberal constitution of Cadiz. Now, the um, uh, curator of Goya's drawings at the Prado, Jose Manuel Matilla, has stated that this album can be seen as Goya's graphic diary in which he recorded all his anxieties, especially as regards the fate of the most disadvantaged, the victims who bore the economic, social, and political consequences of the post-war period with whom the elderly artist, who is now old, deaf, and a precarious financial and political situation due to his ideas could identify to a great extent. We're looking at one of the drawings from the album. Uh, this is album C-17, and it's entitled, This is How Useful Men Usually End Up. And it's done in brush and carbon ink wash. Remember, these are just on one side of the sheet now. Um, this once useful man is a victim of the war and the poverty that it inflicted. He's now bent with age, crippled and doomed to a miserable existence. Goya depicts him alone and isolated on the page in a space defined only by his shadow. He walks by holding on to two sticks, but in his perseverance and willpower that uh, allow him to maintain this precarious balance. Now there's a large group of drawings in this album that refer to the Inquisition. This is from page 85 to page 114. And it concerns the unjust practices of the Holy Office, leading many scholars to call album C the Inquisition album, although it has lots of other subjects too. Goya depicts the victims of the Inquisition, their trials, how they were sentenced, put in prison, tortured, and finally their anticipation of release. And we're looking at album C87, executed with brush and washes of iron gall and gray brown ink over traces of black chalk. This portrays a condemned woman viewed full front who's gagged and bound hand and foot. She's dressed in the inquisitional penitential garments, the carotha, that tall pointed paper cap, and the San Benito, this paper scapular. And you notice across the scapular, Goya's written this very long explanatory title for this drawing. They put a gag on her because she talked and struck her in the face. I saw her, Rossia Moreno in Taragosa for knowing how to make mice. <laughs> you know, that's a very strange inscription. Um, well, we know that Goya says, I saw her in Targosa, and he must have witnessed this event when he was a boy, because documentary sources prove that the auto de fe in which Horacia Morenos was condemned took place in Targosa on the 26th of October, 1766. And at that time, Goya was 14 years old and living in Targosa. Aracia must have been gagged and struck in the face because of her verbosity during the trial and her crime of knowing 
uh, who uh, knowing how to make mice could refer to her ability to cause infestations of rats, which the Inquisition would have judged an act of witchcraft. In this drawing, therefore, Goya condemns the superstitions and injustices of the Inquisition's proceedings and of the Spanish judicial system in general. The final part of Album C includes several allegorical drawings in which liberty, truth, reason, and justice are the protagonists. These drawings come after images of figures imprisoned and condemned by the Inquisition and relate to the period, as I said, of the liberal triennial. This is from 1820 to 23. Uh, this began with 1820 when a man named Rafael Riego led a revolt that forced the King Ferdinand VII to restore the liberal constitution, uh, 1812, and the freedom of the press. Now, um, we're looking at album C-115, Divine Liberty. A man kneels on the ground with outstretched arms to welcome joyfully the new liberty represented by diagonal shafts of divine light. At his feet, an inkwell quill and a half-written sheet of paper suggested he's a writer, and the celestial light illuminates a new age of freedom of the press that was brought about by the liberal triennium. In album C-117, which is inscribed, Lux ex tenebris, light out of the darkness, the flying woman resembles a female figure that we just saw symbolizing truth um, in the last part of the uh, disasters of war. And the small glowing book she holds represents the liberal 1812 constitution. The light radiated by truth and the book rises like a new sun over Spain, just emerging from the darkness of obscuritism, superstition, and tyranny. You see that? Um, album C-118 um, is the only one in, that has the, the title written on the previous drawing. It's on uh, the previous sheet, looks like to Nebris, and the title is, um, this is only discovered recently, Justice Does Not Suit Everyone. Justice does not suit everyone. And you see, like uh, light out of darkness, it uses light out of darkness, but it's to show the contrasting reactions to the arrival of justice as a result of the reestablishment of the Constitution in 1820. The scales of justice and perfect balance appear in a glowing light that illuminates the dark, cloudy sky and the figures below. Uh, on the left, the supporters of justice receive its arrival with admiration and rejoicing. Notice one woman is clasping her hands with rapture, another woman's dancing with joy. And in contrast, the detractors of justice on the right, who felt they had the most to lose in the new order, react with fear. A monk and a nun draw back in shock, while this black priest in the foreground turns his back on the vision and flees into the darkness. And this one is entitled Divine Reason, Don't Spare One of Them. This is a C-122. The young woman representing reason relates to the female figures in the previous drawing who personify truth. She's dressed in white, crowned with laurel leaves, and in one hand she holds the scales of justice, while with the other she raises a whip to chase away a flock of predatory ravens. These blackbirds represent the dark forces of intolerance and oppression propagated by the monastic orders in Spain. Goya suggests that by attacking and ch chasing away these dark forces, uh, reason will bring about a more just and liberal new order. In fact, during the liberal triennial, many mon monasteries and convents were closed. And in a series of drawings after this one, Goya depicts monks and nuns who were forced by the secularization laws to renounce their vows and even to divest themselves of their habits. So they had to leave, you see, all the monasteries and, and so on. Now we're coming to Goya's most difficult series. Uh, the, these 22 etchings that form the unfinished series, Los Disparates. Um, these are Goya's least understood uh, creations. In my opinion, Goya probably worked on the series from about 1819 to uh, 1824. He seems to have abandoned the series when he left for France in 1824. Uh, so he didn't complete this series and we're not sure of the sequence uh, that he intended for the series or any, so this complicates the difficulty of the series. None of them have a, has a date, nor there's, a clear, there's no clear indication of the order, as I said, in which they were to be published. Um, the first posthumous printing of 18 of the prints took place about 1848, long after Goya's death. And this is indicated by a paper-bound set that I've studied in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's inscribed, Goya, the Proverbs, Madrid, about 1848. The Royal Ac Academy, the Real Academia de San Fernando, printed an edition of 360 sets in 1864, and it titled the series The Proverbs, 
believing perhaps that the prints illustrated specific Spanish proverbs or that they were allegories or parables. Um, four additional plates were first published in 1877 in the French magazine, L'Art. No other plates have since come to light, but 34 working proofs are presently known, and 14 of these working proofs, like you see here, this one, uh, carry Goya's handwritten titles, all of which begin with the Spanish word disparate. Now, this can be translated as folly or absurdity, but in Goya's age, it meant a deed or saying beyond the limits of reason or rule. So the series title Los Disparates is that which best evokes the sense of human irrationality that's present in all the etchings, not the term, the Proverbs, which the Academy uh, didn't really understand. Goya's working proofs reveal that in the Academy's posthumous impressions, too much ink was left on the plates so that the boundaries between dark areas of aquatint and the unworked light areas were blurred. You can see that by comparing these two. One's a working proof. You see, the ink wasn't applied as heavily as when the Academy published these. So in working proofs, you can see the more correct balance that Goya intended for, for the scene. Um, and that one, of course, what we've just been looking at is entitled Disparate de Carnival, a carnival folly. Nigel Glendenning has related many of the etchings to carnival themes. It's true that he entitled this, this one, this one, uh, as I just said, Carnival Folly, this brought to the Carnival. There are others that depict grotesque, uh, grotesque masquerades and refer to other carnival cust uh, customs, such as women tossing mannequins in a blanket and figures dancing in the streets. This is the feminine folly. And that relates to some of these carnival practices. Also, um, there you see the, the working proof um, with the title, Goya's handwritten title. This is in the Lazaro Galdiano Foundation in Madrid. And also this one, Goya didn't title this, it's known as Simpleton, uh, Bobalicon in Spanish. Um, but this refers to carnival, these figures called giants and cabezudas, giants and big heads. And this figure, you see this simpleton with this grinning, uh, rather idiotic expression and a very big head relates to that carnival tradition. Now here, um, just a moment. Here we're looking at one called Hisperate Allegre, Mary Folly. Um, and this is a working proof in Goya's handwriting. The working proof for this one is in the Fine Arts Museum in Boston. Um, and it's about old age and lust. In contrast to Goya's early tapestry, oh, sorry, to this tapestry cartoon, The Dance on the Banks of the River Montanares. And this is one a very early work. Goya did these tapestry cartoon uh, studies to be woven into tapestries. Um, but you see here, we see a very early optimistic scene, young men and women of the lower classes, the majos and majas, uh, dancing these segadillas with castanets in a brightly painted luminous landscape on the banks of the river Montanares outside Madrid. But in the disparate, you notice this world is turned into a nightmare. Um, uh, three old men, one is very monkey-like. If you look over there at the uh, far left, he's very monkey-like. Um, and another with a prominent bulge in his trousers, click castanets and dance wildly with three young buxom smirking women in a dark, sinister and barren setting. Uh, where you notice if you look at the horizon line, even the horizon line is out of balance. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, of course, to convey this unbalanced, um, out of sync world that Goya is depicting in the Disparates. This one's a more complicated work. Goya didn't title this one, but we usually call it Folly of Fear. And it was plate two in the Academy's publication. Um, and this recalls the disasters of war. It shows a group of French soldiers who are frightened by what, what appears to be a giant phantom. Uh, it was actually inspired by a battle that was fought on the 14th of June, 1808, during the War of Independence in Catalonia. And it commemorates um, some lines in a poem by Juan Bautista Arieta, Arieta. He wrote this poem, a patriotic poem, Prophecy of the Pyrenees, where the Colossus of the Pyrenees, the guardian spirit of Spain, reprimands Napoleon saying, if you surprised in vain the industrious people of Barthino, Barthino's reference of Barcelona, uh, look at them now mocking the arts of Vulcan and in their hands drilling out the pine tree. So it has to do with pine trees now. 
with victorious echoes, they quiet your horrible cannons. Well, these verses refer to this battle, a battle of the Bruch, in which Catalan ruler corps of badly armed civilians, assisted by soldiers who had escaped from occupied Barcelona, fooled the French legions of General Chabrun by creating artillery from the trunks of pine trees, which were cleverly transformed to resemble cannons. And the Catalans successfully resisted the French attacks and forced the French troops to retreat to Barcelona. This victory brought about by Catalan ingenuity stimulated resistance throughout Spain to the French invaders. And here you see um, uh, a trial proof that's in the British Museum so that the, the, the ink is more correct than Goya would have intended it to be seen. And Goya refers to the battle by including in the background Spanish civilians and two soldiers with a long tree-like cannon and a towering pine tree. These figures with their backs to the spectator are united and compact as a group. And thanks to the cunning and strategy they have exceeded in conquering their powerful armed uh, enemies. The giant phantom in the foreground is a trick construction uh, made of sheets draped over a tree and manipulated by a man. If you look very closely at the sleeve there, you can see his face peeking out, uh, this, this man who is really in the uh, uh, sheets here. And, and so he's peeking out and he's mocking the group of terrified French soldiers. Two of the soldiers, two of the French soldiers lie panic stricken on the ground. Two others raise themselves up to look in horror at the phantom. The fifth soldier has a saber raised in his right hand and flees from what he believes to be a frightful apparition. These French soldiers are possessed by their own panic and fear and therefore unable to recognize what is like the cannons made from pine trees, only an ingenious improvised creation. A creation nevertheless, that represents the colossal spirit of resistance of the Spanish people. So we see in the disasters, uh, uh, sorry, in the disparates, a sense of the ascendancy of human irrationality. And, and this dominates the series and it almost totally eclipses um, now Goya's work. And the hope for irrational, sorry, the hope for rationality that had motivated a younger and more optimistic Goya to create the caprichos um, uh, has now been replaced by this very depressing, um, uh, the triumph really of irrationality in the disparates. Um, and of course, uh, these are influenced by earlier tapestry cartoons, the caprichos and the disasters of war. Um, some of the disparates contain his comments about lust, marriage, war, old age, and death, while others reflect his meditations on the religious and political forces that had turned Spain into a monstrous, irrational world. Well, on the 17th of September, 1823, Goya, probably fearful that the restored absolute monarch, um, absolutist regime of King Ferdinand VII would confiscate his country estate and house. His uh, country house is called the Quinta del Sordo, the villa, the villa of the deaf man. Um, there had been a deaf man living there before Goya. Of course, Goya was also deaf. Um, and he signed this estate over to his grandson, Mariano. Um, uh, this was in September, 1823. In May, 1824, when a general amnesty was declared, the artist promptly asked the king for a six month leave of absence on the pretext that he wanted to take the mineral waters at Plombier in France. The leave was granted. And at, by the beginning of September, 1824, after a two month stay in Paris, he went first to Paris, Goya resided in Bordeaux with his companion, Leocadia Weiss and her children until his death on the 16th of April, 1828. In about 1825 to 28, after printing of the lithographic series known as the Bulls of Bordeaux, I haven't been able to include all the, the bullfight series and so on, but I want to just show you this one lithograph from the bullfight series, the Bulls of Bordeaux, because Goya took up lithography very late in his career. Um, but after, after doing these, he worked on two new drawing albums known as Album G and Album H that are in black crayon, like he used on the limestone to create his lithographs. Uh, here we're looking at, at one of the, the Bordeaux drawings now. One of the drawings in Album G is dated 1826, and of the 60 drawings that originally comprised this album, only five are now lacking, so we have all of them except for five. In contrast, the 63 drawings that made up Album H only three are lacking. Um, almost all the drawings in Album G have inscriptions written in Goya's own hand, while only six in Album H have inscriptions, whereas up to sheet 40, all are only signed Goya. 
In both albums, Goya's focus is on human nature, but in some scenes, animals also appear based on real animals, but also recalling those of ancient Greek fables and of Aesop. There are images of things Goya saw in France, others based on remembered past experiences in Spain, and the subjects in album G include unusual modes of transport, lunatics, and punishments. Uh, here we're looking at one called Animal de Letras, Animal of Letters, or Literate Animal, Literate Animal. This is G4. It depicts a large humanoid dog-like animal with a serious, rather sad expression that holds in his paws an open book that he clearly, he's clearly incapable of reading it, while behind him a man stifles a laugh and appears to be about to beat the animal with a stick. The drawing might be influenced by Goy's knowledge of a wonder dog named Munito. Um, this was a cross between a hound and a water spaniel that visited Bordeaux in April 1826. Many drawings are influenced by things he saw in Bordeaux. And this dog amazed spectators with the ability to so-called read letters of the alphabet, solve mathematical problems, play dominoes, and know colors. However, it's more like the Goya satirizing men of letters in this work, because usually these things aren't quite what they appear. Usually they're satires. And um, as he, he did this similar kind of satire with uh, literate asses in this drawing from the Madrid album entitled Masquerades of Asses. There are asses masquerading as men of letters. And also in this dream one, the literate ass, you see. Um, so uh, uh, like those asses, the literate uh, um, animal here, this dog-like creature, puts on airs of erudition and uses his feigned knowledge to exploit and live at the expense of those who do not know any better. He, he looks rather sad to me. Now we've seen that Goya is very interested in dreams and how they can turn into nightmares. In drawing C12, he's captured this bad dream, mal sueño. It's inscribed over a barely visible earlier title, Talking Apparition. It depicts a man wrapped in a cloak who cries out in horror, his hair standing on end, at the nightmare vision of his disembodied floating head in the upper right, which is being attacked by a flock of these pecking black birds. His tense hand also conveys his terror and contrasts with his two cats that sit calmly beside him, perhaps awaiting their own chance to devour the attacking birds. It has been suggested this man may feel that his head has separated from his body so that he can no longer control his thoughts, thereby making this drawing a masterful analysis of the madness that may emerge with age or illness. This work would therefore relate to other drawings in album G. There's a whole section of madmen, lunatics in album C. Here's one of them uh, that's in the British Museum, uh, just called Locos Lunatics. Um, so the, this was, Goy was very interested in, in the mad in, in earlier paintings too. Now we're turning, we're going to turn to album H. The compositions in album H are less complex and include a great variety of subjects, flying figures, violence and cruelty, monks and religion, demons, young women and children, and old men. A group of drawings are based on figures that Goy actually saw in Bordeaux at the Bordeaux Fair in 1826. And these include this depiction of a man holding a, a snake four yards long, another turban man performing with a small crocodile, a giant woman ogled by spectators, and a living skeleton who Goya describes as Claudio Ambrosio Surratt, called the living skeleton in Bordeaux, the year 1826. So these are actually things that Goya saw. These are real things that he observed at the fair in Bordeaux. Um, and this next one is really curious. <laughs> um, this is H42. It's known as the enema. Goya didn't title it. In Spanish, it's called La Ayuda, the help, but it's not titled by Goya. Um, it, sh it shows three women who smile mercilessly as they are about to administer anal punishment on a terrified man. An old woman in back holds a syringe to give the enema to the man, while a seated woman removes a knife from his hands that he may have intended to use on one of the women. A large urinal at the left awaits the contents of the man's bowels, while you notice this youngest kneeling woman, we just see through the legs here, um, uh, she gleefully inspects the man's bottom and awaits the outcome. 
Now, this seems to be recalling an event from his hometown of Saragossa that he represented in an earlier brush and iron gall drawing of 1812 to 20 from another album, Album F. I'm not going to go into that album, but you can see this drawing. It depicts a constable called Lampinos who abused prostitutes in Saragossa and was put to death by a group of these prostitutes who gave him a fatal enema of quicklime. Goya includes this long inscription at the top of the drawing that reads, death of the constable Lampinos due to his persecution of students and prostitutes who administered him an enema of quicklime. Now here we're looking at drawing H61. This is not titled by Goya. It's known as Phantom Dancing with Castanets, but it's, it's clearly a monk. The figure's long robes really identify him as a monk. And we've seen throughout his works, Goya is also satirizing corrupt and idle clergy and dissolute monks. And this continues in the Bordeaux albums. This obese monk with a large head, um, he recalls his large head and so on, recalls that simpleton in the Disparates too. Um, and he's dancing, you see this wide grinning mouth, dancing with abandon, uh, this frenzied dance. Perhaps it's like a high kicking jota, one of these uh, Spanish dances where you, you have high kicks. And he's dancing to the sound of castanets, as you can see. The drawing is one of only three in album age uh, that is uh, completely, uh, uh, has this completely dark shadowy background, which creates a sinister setting for the dancing monk. Goya uses this grinning monk in his frenzied dance to satirize the life of pleasure um, and wanton abandonment lived by many monks inside these religious institutions of his age. These late drawings by Goya reflect the age in which he lived but they also foreshadow the human irrationality, madness, corruption, and terrible violence of the 20th century. Goya, of course, is now viewed very universally uh, because of, of similar things going on. In the final drawing I want to show you, numbered 54 from album G, Goya shows himself in the guise of his patron saint, San Francisco de Paula, St. Francis of Paula, whom he depicted in one of his earliest uh, engravings here. Uh, etching, sorry, of 1776 to 1777. The artist's complete name was Francisco de Paula Jose Goya y Lucientes, and his saint's day, in Spain you have a saint's day, and his saint's day was April the 2nd. That's the feast day of Saint Francis of Paula. He was an Italian saint who lived from 1416 to 1507, founder of the Minim Friars, famous for his miraculous cures. He was patron saint of hermits and he lived to be 91 years old. This saint must have assuaged the 80 year old Goya's own anxieties concerning old age and death because in a letter written to his son Javier shortly before Goya's death, which occurred on April 16th, 1828, the artist wondered whether he might not live to the age of 99 like Titian. In the drawing, the old man with a long beard is bent with age and he must work, walk with these two sticks, you see. Here's a late self-portrait of Goya, um, Goya at 78, uh, which is in the Prado Museum. So this old man, uh, his, uh, in Goya in the guise of his patron saint, is walking, uh, he has to use these two staffs. But, but like the eternally young Goya, he exclaims and written at the top, Aun aprendo, I am still learning. So even though Goya saw his country overwhelmed by irrationality and folly and very real witches and demons. He never abandoned his optimistic desire to learn new things. Thanks very much. I give you a, a, a recent bibliography of some of the key books because lots of new um, studies of Goya are coming out now because of his 275th a commemoration of his birth. Thank you, Frank. That was wonderful. Um, Michael, were you going to say some last words? Yes. Um, look, thanks, Esther. And um, I, I noticed that uh, not many <laughs> have put in, in into the chat, and but I can understand that uh, just listening and, and taking in uh, Frank's uh, presentation was uh, uh, one really had to concentrate on that. Frank, um, I'm never going to look at Goya um, again in the same way after this. And you're um, particularly putting into context these these works. Um, it's it's been uh, just a, a wonderful walkthrough. Um, the the um, 
the drawings and uh, and the prints of Goya. And uh, on behalf of all of us here in the uh, art history uh, chapter, we would like to thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we're glad and pleased that this has been recorded because it's something that I hope all of us will come back to and, uh, and, and listen again and, and look at these images. And what a great pity it was that uh, with all these images sitting in the National Gallery last year, uh, so few of us could actually see them because uh, of uh, COVID, but uh, there you go. But anyway, thank you very much. You've brought them to us in a way that I think uh, gives even more context to them than, uh, than, there were, than we could see in the exhibition. Uh, but again, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, really appreciated this and uh, uh, we do, um, uh, we look forward to seeing this again, but also hoping to, to meet in person so we can continue uh, this wonderful conversation about Goya. Thank you very much, Frank. Thanks so much. Thank you.